Good evening. Are you bored already? <laughs> Flunking tests. I've never had been accused of that. Failed my test. Brother Peacock was in town. I flunked. I hope, certainly hope not. What a blessing to be here. We've had a tremendous time already. The hospitality has been exceptional. Uh, you folks have been very kind. I found uh, uh, some things real interesting at the zoo today. I was thinking of naming certain maybe Bible believers and associating them with animals that I saw today. And then I thought that wasn't very pastoral to do that. So I prayed and asked the Lord to forgive me. And he said, the first animal that you look at is what I see when I see you. It was a wombat. I was like, well, gee, Lord, thanks a lot. He said, well, that's what you get for thinking that way about my people. So I didn't see a single sheep in the bunch. I saw a bunch of goats. So, but anyway, it has really been a blessing. Would you like to stand, stretch your legs for just a second? And I'm going to be in a few places tonight, but I, I would like to, if you'll give me the privilege, I, I'm respectful of your time, and, uh, but I recognize that you came, hopefully, Lord willing, to give you something here. And so I, I want to talk to you about this. I find oftentimes uh, we accuse as preachers and sometimes even as Bible believers, we accuse people of certain things uh, because they don't have the necessary information that they need to make the right decision or to have the right perception. A lot of us have sort of a one-sided or a lopsided God. We know a lot about His wrath and His judgment. We know a lot about those things. We need to balance that with His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His long-suffering, right? And then oftentimes what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is our relationship with the Lord after we get saved. The old preacher used to say, who wrote that song uh, uh, that they sang here just previously, the old preacher used to say this, after salvation, the most important thing in a man or a woman's life is his fellowship with Jesus Christ. In other words, the relationship has to continue to grow. If he's everlasting, sometimes what happens is we sort of hit that ceiling and we're like, oh, okay, well, this is all there is to God. And then we don't remember that, you know what, there's more to God than maybe how we've drawn it up. And sometimes it's our fault as preachers because of a lack of giving you instruction that there's a whole lot more to God than just the right and the wrong and the good and the bad and the sin and the lack of sin in our lives. That's sort of one dimension of a multidimensional God, right? And so after you're saved, you have to continually ask you, am I growing in the Lord? Uh, or do I take persecution better than I used to take persecution? Do I take persecution joyfully? Do I go through trouble better than I used to go through trouble? Do I gossip less than I used to gossip and so on and so forth? And so sometimes what happens is, is our focal point becomes what we're going to talk about today. And we only see it, generally speaking, from maybe one perspective. And that has to do with the altar. And the altar is not just a place, not just in front of a building and those kind of things. An altar can be anywhere, but there are a multitude of different things that that altar represents. It's a place for you to be able to come to get things right. Now, let me say this to you. Just, quote, getting right with God doesn't necessarily cre increase your relationship with God. It starts the foundation or clears the foundation for you to be able to have a structure. Does that make sense to you? But oftentimes it stops right there. Well, I got right with God. Okay, well, have you grown since you got right with God? No, I'll wait till I mess up again, then I'll fess up again, and then I'll get started all over. Well, I'm going to try to show you a couple of things here tonight. Hopefully that'll help you. Let's just look at one verse. If you're in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter number 18, and we're going to come back to this in just a little while. But I'm going to pose the question to you. Uh, at the end of this, 1 Kings chapter number 18, look if you will please in verse number 30. The Bible said, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Preacher, would you pray? Ask the Lord to help us. Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. I appreciate that. Let me go all the way back. You can be seated. Thank you. Y'all are so kind. It's unbelievable. No, let's stand back up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to see if it would work. 
You know, you have to go back to a thing called the law of first mention that's in the Bible. It's a basic rule of Bible study. Oftentimes when you see something mentioned for the first time, it'll generally hold true later on throughout the Bible. And so you can learn some basics or foundational things when it comes to the study of the Bible. When we're talking about an altar, you would think to yourself, well, where's the first altar appear? It looks to appear in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter number 3, you have a mess that occurred there where the devil comes down there and he tempts a woman by the name of Eve. That's the mother of all living. Just Adam and Eve are in the earth at the time. And he comes down and says, Yea, hath God said, and I won't go and preach a whole message there, but I want you to recognize that after she partook of the fruit, there was collateral damage. And the collateral damage was that when she went to her husband, she had enough influence on her husband to misdirect her husband. Now, you ladies like that story because it's a romantic tale. But in the Bible, whenever you see the woman trying to misdirect the head of the household, it always ends in great tragedy. The world today, especially the United States, I can't speak necessarily with any authority for how you live here, is always trying to subvert what God says. Now that doesn't mean that the husband has to be a tyrant. It doesn't mean he has to be a dictator. It doesn't mean he has to be. But God ordained that the head of the man is the Lord and the head of the woman is the man. Now I didn't do that. So don't start throwing tomatoes at me right now. But in the modern world, they're trying to reverse that. The world is so messed up today that they're even saying, however God made you, that you should change how God made you because God made a mistake when He made you. And therefore, you know, if you feel like you're going to need to get in touch with your inner self and it happens to be a he or a she or an it or whatever it might be, that then maybe... No, that's completely wrong. God made them male and female. He didn't create Adam and Steve. He made Adam and... Eve, a man and a woman. When he said it's not good that a man should dwell alone, he created for him Eve to complete the man. And of course, when he saw her, he said, whoa, man. I mean, that's a... (laughs) And he's been saying, whoa, ever since, right? But here's the thing you have to recognize, ma'am. You have the power to influence your husband. You must utilize that power to always influence him toward God, not away from God. Remember this about Eve, and this isn't intended to be a rebuke. I'm not here to straighten somebody's pictures. But remember this about that about Eve. The Bible says the tree was good for food. Is that right? Desire to make one wise. You shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Eve didn't fall down. She fell up. She did what was good for her, but it wasn't right. You have to be able to, as a Christian, say, just because it's good, it doesn't always mean that it's right. And so, ma'am, I just want to suggest to you, Jezebel, it looks like Ahab, almost gets persuaded by the old preacher Elijah, and Jezebel comes in there continually and manipulates the situation and literally causes that man to make it easy to find his way to hell because of the fact that he continues to listen to her, continues to listen to her until she misguides and misdirects him. And then I'm saying to you, ma'am, careful how you use your influence. Well, she comes up there and Adam, you know, looks at her and you look at the story and you say, oh, well, that's wonderful because, you know, he died for her and that kind of a thing. What should the man have done, preacher? The man should have said, well, honey, I'm really sorry to say that, but you know what? The Bible may teach, I mean, people may believe it's cheaper to keep her, but I'm going to go ahead and kick you to the curb. I'm going to stick with God. Now, that's a tough thing. Uh, But gentlemen, I I don't know what the Lord would have done and how he would have fixed the thing up. But he wasn't right to go contrary to what God told him to do. Instead, he went contrary. You know why he did it? Because of the influence of a woman. Need I say any more about that? That's a good place for you to kind of bow down and say, how am I using my influence? I've seen mothers influence their kids the right way, and I've seen mothers influence their kids the wrong way. I've seen mothers or, or women influence their husbands the right way. I've seen women influence their husbands the wrong way. I'm not preaching to husbands yet. We'll get there in a little while. But I want you to understand something, ma'am. God gave you the ability and gave you the opportunity to influence or to use your influence the right way or the wrong way. Uh, They've always said for years, and it may not be a a, a true fact absolutely, but they've always said that generally speaking in the household that the woman sets the temperature (coughs) spiritually, excuse me, in the household. And get just a smidgen of water or a shot of espresso or something, it doesn't matter. (laughs) If you give me espresso, you'll be here till midnight. You'll be like Eutychus. You'll be, (laughs) you'll be done fell out the window, you know. Yeah, you'd have cussed too if you'd have fell out the window. (laughs) 
Yes, you would have. Don't say you wouldn't have. You might have just done it in your mind. <laughs> but here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. All of a sudden, they realize they're out of fellowship with the Lord. And the very thing that they should have run to, they ran away from. Obviously, sin separates us from a holy God. You have to always remember, you can't try to get Him to come down here and to be like you. It's our job to go up there to be like Him. They're trying to humanize the Lord just a little bit too much nowadays to make Him too much. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. They're trying to... What is that in there? <laughs> Wombat droppings? What is that, Doc? <laughs> They're trying just a little bit too hard today to try to bring the Lord down, to try to sort of dirty Him up, to try to make Him so, so perfectly human. Listen, He was all God and all man, but trust me when I tell you, He never sinned, tempted in all points, yet without sin. Are you with me? So the very thing that they should have been running to, they ran away from. As a matter of fact, when the Lord comes down there, He's there in the garden. He walks up there and looking around the garden. Now, if He knows everything, He's omniscient. That's the big word for it. He knows everything there is to know. He looks down there and He says, Adam, where are you? Which is an odd question. Do you not think he knows where Adam is? Sure he knows where Adam is. Why did he ask him the question? The same reason I'm asking you the question tonight. It's not that God doesn't know where you are. It's do you know where you are? Adam, what are you doing? Uh, I'm over here in the bushes. What in the cat hair are you doing? It's a southern Jesus. What in the cat hair are you doing over in the bushes over there? He said, uh, well, I, I, I was naked and afraid. Naked? Who told you you were naked? Uh, 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 well, uh, 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 what you been eating, boy? Um, well, um, well, I ate this piece of fruit. Uh, where'd you get that from? Well, Lord, the woman you gave me. <laughs> uh, you know what? The devil, the, the devil will try to convince you that it's somebody else's fault. You know what the Lord likes to see? A man that'll take responsibility for his own actions. Boy. Instead of blaming it on his environment and blaming it on this and the prejudice and this and that and the other. I mean, I think a man that has a backbone like a saw log, and I'm not talking about as far as his strength or his ability physically, but he has the courage to say, I was wrong and I did wrong and I pray the Lord will forgive me and I pray you'll forgive me. That takes real courage. Not Adam. He ducks behind the woman. He looks at the woman. He said, what did you do? And she said, well, the serpent. Uh, you may find yourself in that situation nowadays. Well, this happened, that happened, so on and so forth. You want to do business with God and get back in fellowship with Him. Now, would you agree that they were in fellowship before the fall? Sure. What happened? All of a sudden, the day they shall eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's a spiritual death that occurs there, let alone later on they're going to die uh, physically. And then the Lord has something broken. I'm going to use it as an illustration to say their fellowship with the Lord is now broken. Now instead of walking with the Lord in the cool of the evening, like they should do, like they had been doing, something's changed. When you fall into sin, when you trip into sin, and when you intentionally sin, whether it's presumptuously or whether you wind up, you know, kind of getting messed up with the wrong thing and it goes further than you think it should go and the Holy Spirit's warning you and your conscience is warning you whenever you sin you don't lose your salvation thank the Lord you don't lose your salvation hey let me ask you a question the last time you got in a fight with your husband or fight with your wife did you just run to the court and get a divorce the marital situation is still by law you're still married is that right but you may be sleeping on the couch tonight Oh, sorry. <laughs> How did he know that, you know? <laughs> but, but at any rate, here's what happens. You know what has to happen? You have to rejoin the fellowship, right? All right, so what happens? The fellowship's been broken. And guess what happens? The Lord says, uh, what are you doing over there hiding? Well, we were naked. We shouldn't have been over there. We lost our clothing of light and those kind of things. You said, well, you got all this new information now, and you're so smart, and you're so wise, and you've learned all these things. But you know what it's cost you to know all those things? Before, you didn't even know you didn't know it. Now you know you know it. Boy, aren't you smart? Yeah, Lord, we're really, really smart. Yeah, but it cost you something. Well, yeah, I mean, I realize that, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Well, it cost me walking with you and talking with you and spending time with you and helping you name animals and helping you look at the sunset that I just painted and picked a lily, uh, picked a, a, a dandelion over here or picked a flower over there and painted you a different colored sunset every night and put the chandeliers of heaven up there called stars and named every one of those things. I can't do that for you now, Adam. Can't do that for you, Eve. Why? Something's been broken. Our relationship has changed. 
you chose whatever that was over me. Well, what did he do? He winds up there. You know the picture, the type picture, the story there is he winds up taking lambs and he makes them a covering of skins. And that means that he winds up shedding blood. And we know that without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And he makes a picture. We see the type of that that takes place. What was it? It was for a restoration. Now listen, when you got saved, you went to Calvary. And the Lamb of God was put there. We'll use that as an altar, the cross of Calvary. That's where your relationship began with the Lord. But it has to grow from that relationship. It can't just be all that I know about the Lord is. I, I come from the South. In the South, a real revival meeting is like this. Well, I got right with God. You did what happened? Yeah, you know, that preacher up there, he preached on cigarettes, and I just gave up my cigarettes, and so me and the Lord got right. Uh, okay, what will it be next time? Well, next time it'll be my rock and roll music, and the next time it'll be my bad movies, and the next time it'll be my bad language, and the next time it'll be... There's more to a relationship with the Lord than Him just getting rid of what's bad. And if you have a better relationship with you, listen, if you're walking with Him and you're talking with Him and you're spending time with Him, you'll be surprised. You don't have to come to Him all the time and say, Lord, I messed up again. I mean, doesn't that ever wear you out as a Christian? Don't you ever get worn out that all you know about the Lord is, is Lord, it's me again. What do you want? Uh, you got another robe in my size that's grown a little bit since there. Go see Omar the tent maker. And uh, Lord, uh, I, need a, I need another robe and I, I need another ring and I need some more shoes because what? I've been in a far country again, Lord, but I'm back again. I sure do miss bread from the Father's table. But ladies and gentlemen, if that's all there is to your relationship, it's going out to the far country and then coming back to the Father's house and then beating a path back and forth between the two, your relationship doesn't grow much. Some of you, you know what happens, you get bitter, you get frustrated. Some of you are already bitter at me because I blame the woman for this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the devil knew who he needed to go to. He didn't come at Adam. Now try to get over that, build a bridge and get over it. And let me give you something else tonight before you just cut me off and be mad at me. You know, you know your husband's over there going, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? You know, hear what he said? You know, <laughs> she's like, you do wait till I get you in the car. I'll straighten you, you know, and I kind of, okay, you know, separate for just a little while. Let me give you something out. But ladies and gentlemen, there's more to a relationship with the Lord than just conviction. I mean, shouldn't it be that way where all of a sudden the Lord's a blessing to you? You get up in the morning, His mercies are renewed every day. And instead of getting up in the morning, I wonder if He's going to hit me today, man. I wonder if I'm going to get caught. Reap what you sow, man. I, man, I guarantee it's coming down the pipe today. And you're always looking over your shoulder. And your idea of God is, is you're like a dog catcher. And you're constantly trying to keep from getting caught and put into the box and then sweating it out and taken somewhere. There should be more in your relationship than just that. And so Adam and Eve come up there. looks like the first altar is erected there and some lambs are offered there to sacrifice and uh, propitiation or to take the place of for their sin. And the Lord restores the fellowship. But can I say this quickly? It still costs them to do that. The forgiveness didn't redu reduce the repercussions for what happened. They still got kicked out of the garden. They still had some repercussions that transpired and took place. And as a result, listen, they were still able to have fellowship with the Lord, but it wasn't in the garden anymore. Well, then the second thing that shows up there is by the Genesis chapter number 4, the Bible says over there that there's Cain and there's Abel. Now, everybody knows that story. And when Cain and Abel are there, you realize that during that time frame, it comes time for them to have a sacrifice. There's another altar that's there. Adam and Eve had properly instructed their sons as they come up. Cain comes up there. He lays up there in front of the Lord the vegetables, the fruits, and the things that he is because he's a farmer. And the Lord doesn't do anything. He doesn't accept it. He doesn't do anything. Abel comes up there, takes a little lamb, lays him up there on the altar, and slits that lamb's throat, and that blood splatters all over the creation there. And he backs off and probably says something, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and please accept this as my sacrifice. And out of an old Carolina blue sky comes that lightning bolt down there and receives that lamb. But the picture changes right there. The picture immediately goes from Abel and the sacrifice being acceptable to Mr. Poochie Lip over here who's upset, frustrated, aggravated, irritated, and, and now all of a sudden he's mad. And the Lord looks down and says, Cain, what's the problem? Why is your countenance fallen? Because I'm an independent Baptist and I'm just going to sit here and look like somebody licked all the chocolate off my peanuts. Right? 
You remember that story, don't you, where the lady was real sick in the hospital and she wasn't feeling well at all and they went in there and did some surgery and she was getting better and, and uh, the preacher went in there to see her. She was sleeping. He didn't want to bother her and he hadn't, hadn't eaten in a day or so and he's kind of hungry and there's some peanuts there on the table and he's looking at the peanuts and eventually he can't take it and he starts eating the peanuts and stuff like that and directly she wakes up from being in that little bit of a stupor from the drugs they were giving her and uh, he looks at her and he says, hey sister, how you doing? She says, hey preacher. He said, I got to tell you before we can even have a conversation, I want to apologize to you. I ate the peanuts out of your dish over here. And she said, that's all right preacher. I done slept all the chocolate off of them. <laughs> I make you kind of think, oh. <laughs> what's the matter, preacher? You're looking a little green, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty bad. And so, so here's what happens. There's Cain's over there, and he's, and he's frustrated. Does it ever frustrate you when you see God blessing somebody and he don't bless you? And you've done all you're going to do? You know what the Lord says? He says to him, he says, Cain, don't you know if you bring me what I want you to bring, I'll bless you too. How about just bringing me what I want? Cain said, I brought with you what I wanted to bring. The Lord said, no, you misunderstood. I said, what I want. See, there's a lot in Genesis 4. You say, what's that? Human nature. Human nature is so uh, uh, bold there, it jumps off that page. It's called salient. It protrudes out of the passage. You know what he said? He said, I brought you what I'm going to bring you. I brought the best I have. Looks like a Michelangelo painting. I mean, who wouldn't accept that? The Lord said, me, I'm not going to accept it. And he said, bring what I want you to bring. And he said, I don't want to bring what you want. He said, be careful now. Sin lieth at the door. He said, all right, well, what do you want? He said, I want a lamb. And he said, a lamb? He said, yeah, I want a lamb. This shouldn't be a problem for you. And he started thinking a minute, and he paused, and he said, a lamb. He said, well, there's only one shepherd in town. And he said, yeah, who is that? He said, well, that's my brother Abel over there. And the Lord said, good, go see him and uh, get you a lamb and bring me the lamb. And he said, you mean go to my brother and get a lamb? And the Lord said, yeah, you go get a lamb from your brother, offer him as a sacrifice, I'll accept it, and then me and you will be in rest restoration, we'll be good, everything will be fine. You mean i got to get right with my brother? You know what Cain did? Cain did what a lot of you will do. You know what Cain did? He said, nothing doing. If me being right with you means i got to get right with my brother, I ain't doing it. I'll leave the church. I'll tuck my tail and run. You get quiet right there. You know what he said? Uh-uh, you're asking more than I want. The Lord said, no, I'm not. I'm just asking you to bring what I want. When's the last time you came to an altar and said, Lord, what would you have me to bring? Not, Lord, here, I'll bring you what I want you to bring. Lord, I'll give you what I want you to give. The Lord said, well, I'm not interested in that. How about you bring it? You know what he has a way? He has a way of going down inside and knowing exactly what's between you and him and between me and him. He knows exactly what that happens to be. And you know what we do? We put on old Cain's look, and the Bible says, why is your countenance fallen? Because I'm an independent Baptist, and I'm not going to send a message to that preacher that I'm enjoying anything whatsoever. I'm going to let him know I'm going to maintain my independence, and I'll be what I want to be and how I want to be, and ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. The Lord said, why don't you come put that countenance on the altar? Oh, Lord, I don't want to. Okay, good. How about bringing all 40 feet of your tongue up here, and let's just put your tongue on the altar. We'll give you a wheelbarrow. I'm not bringing you my tongue, Lord. I mean, I think my opinions matter more than what your scripture says. I'm not trying to be hard on you. It gets better. I'm just trying to set things up for you. I'm telling you there's more than one altar in the Bible. You know why Cain missed out? Cain missed out because he wouldn't bring what God wanted him to bring. Cain had a great opportunity there. God's talking to him. Can you imagine that? Like he used to talk to Adam. You know what? He's having a conversation with him. Could you imagine Almighty God is saying to you, Hey, i am fixed this for you. I'm not interested in your works. I want you to accept my son Jesus Christ. I mean, hey, I'll take it, Lord. I, amen. Praise the Lord. I'll take it. And then after you're saved, he comes to you and tells you, I don't want that. This is what I want. And he has that opportunity right there. And you know what he says? Nothing doing. And the Lord said, Careful. Sin lieth at the door. 
The devil's right out there, a roaring lion walks about seeking him may devour. When you step out there, boy, like that little prophet in 1 Kings 13, he's going to knock you off that donkey and eat you alive, man. You better stop. You better quit now. And Cain said, I don't care, man. I'll make it on my own. I could care less. And he just kind of threw up his hand to the Lord and said, I'll take whatever's coming to me. The Lord said, all right, a fugitive and a vagabond thou shalt be all the days of thy life. And it's not long before you wind out. Guess where he winds up? He winds over there where you find sinners the first time in the Bible. You say, what is it? We call it back home circling the drain. We call it back home, that individual's done. You say, why? Now he's gotten so bitter, he's gotten so frustrated, he's gotten so aggravated. There's no record of him ever trying to get that thing right with the Lord. I've seen that thing happen dozens of times. I've seen where God gives an, op an individual opportunity. It almost forms a ling like a cross. And the Lord said, why don't you go fix that thing? Don't you realize that you can give place to the devil? That's what he says. Now I'll be in uh, 2 Corinthians. You don't have to turn there. I'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It'll be around 10, 11, 12 right along there. And Paul says about the boy that got messed up in that mess that's over in 1 Corinthians 5. He gets all messed up over there and the boy finally gets right over the thing and uh, Paul tells him, he says, listen, to whom you forgive, I forgive also. Let the thing go. Why? Lest Satan should get an advantage of you. But you know what happens? He lies at the door and we're like, I don't care. I don't care. I ain't bringing it. I ain't bringing it. I'm not doing it. Well, I guess you just have to go on about your uh, life without the Lord. Doesn't mean you're lost, but it means you're out of fellowship. You realize when you're out of fellowship, you can't get a prayer through? You realize when you're out of fellowship, you can't intercede on the behalf of somebody else? You realize the risk and the collateral damage of you not being able to get a prayer through when you might have lost family members? You might have a Muslim husband you've been praying for for 25 years, and if she's not in fellowship with the Lord, she can pray to her knees have got calluses on them, and the Lord's saying, we need to get things right. We need to know you need to save my husband. We need to get things right. Lord, you need to save my husband. You need to get things right until you get that thing right. You know what happened? Your prayers stagnate. They freeze right there. You ever pray and the ceiling doesn't seem to get above the ceiling? You say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. Do you ever stop the check? Do you ever say, uh, Lord, is there something in my life that's holding you up? Maybe he'll ask you for that. That's the second time that thing shows up. Well, let's hurry on through here. Uh, let's look maybe, oh, I'll skip a couple there. We'll go to Genesis chapter number uh, 8. That'll be... Let's uh, see, left-hand side of my Bible there toward the bottom there to be about the last three or four verses. This will be when, uh, when uh, Noah comes off the ark there. You remember that? It'll be Genesis chapter 8. I, you'll have to help me out here. I don't want to jump back up here in my notes. I got it written down. Genesis 8 toward the end there. Verse 20 and Noah an altar. That's it. That's it. What's the number? 20? All right, verse 20, Noah built an altar. You know what comes on that altar? Those clean animals that he's had with him during that whole time out there when the thing with the flood came and the people pounded on the doors and the Lord shut to the door and doesn't let them in and then they're out there floating around. Well, look at that altar. Well, they've been on the, the ark all that period of time. What do they have to sacrifice for sin? They haven't done anything. I mean, it's Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives and Mrs. Noah and Mr. Noah and that's all that's on there. Well, so what do they have? There? There's no movies there, no internet, and no television, and no you know, ungodliness and no wickedness or anything going on. Well, what in the cat here is that altar doing there? You know what that for right there? That altar and offering those clean animals is for one thing and one thing only. It's gratitude. I'm coming to the altar to say, Lord, I sure do appreciate you getting me through the flood. I sure appreciate you getting me through the storm. I sure do appreciate you delivering me all those years that we were building that ark and people laughing at us and mocking and making fun. I sure appreciate you giving me the strength to feed all these animals. I sure appreciate you giving me a wife. I sure appreciate you. You know what that altar is? It's literally nothing more than gratitude. I mean, think about this. When was the last time you went to the altar? A fellow said one time, he said, how's your prayer life? He said, well, I don't know. Did you pray today? He said, no, I didn't need anything. Been there, done that. Our idea of prayer is, is that, you know, well, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. When was the last time you came to the Lord in prayer and you came to the altar and said, Lord, I want to give you something? What do you want to give me? Thank you, Lord, for getting me through the mess. Thank you, Lord, for preserving my life. Thank you, Lord, for delivering me from myself. Thank you, Lord, for helping me with the test. Thank you, Lord, for helping me with this and that and the other. Let me say this about tests real quick, just for what it's worth. There's a Catholic priest and a Baptist preacher sitting at a fight ringside one night, and they're getting ready, and the guys come to the main event 
event and they come around there and they're bobbing and weaving over in the corner and shucking and jiving and getting ready to go and that kind of a thing. And uh, about the time they get ready for the fight, the guy gets over and he kneels in the corner, you know, and he crosses himself. And the Baptist preacher looks at the Catholic priest. He says, what, is all, what does all that stuff mean and all that? And the Catholic priest thought of it for a second, took a big old long draw off of his stogie there, and he blew the smoke out and he said, it don't mean anything if he can't fight. <laughs> Sometimes you ask the Lord to help you pass the test, but you didn't study for it. You have to study to show yourself approved. Okay, that's, for just, that's extra. No extra charge for that whatsoever. <laughs> that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> and the time the Lord hears prayers is when there's a hurricane, a bad storm, a flood, or a bad fire coming on, and test day. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, Lord, I help me. Lord, help me to remember everything the teacher taught me while I was sleeping in class. I know it's in my subconscious somewhere, right? You know what you find there in Genesis chapter number 8? In Genesis chapter number 8, you find a man that gets off the ark and the first thing he does is set the example for his family and he says, you know what, before we even step off of here and we're fruitful and multiply, that'll be Genesis 9, 1 and 2 and 3 there, before we're fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, uh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pause right here and thank God he got us to where he got us to. I mean, just have a good old-fashioned praise service. I like your ideas. Let's give, the, let's give the Lord praise. What did God do for you today? You ever think about that? I mean, just thanking God. Well, we've got to hurry through here. I've only got about 20 of these, and I'm about only two or three down. So let me give you a couple more here. By the time you get over to Genesis uh, well, let's see, 13, there's a division there with uh, oh, Abraham and Lot. Let's just skip over that one. Come to, come to 15. Come to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter number 15, you have a man there named Abram. Abram is uh, Abraham, but, but he has to go out and give, uh, uh, if you'll remember, he has to give tithes to Melchizedek. You remember that? And that's where he got the ham from. You give tithes, the Lord will put some ham on you. <laughs> anyway, well, that's funny. <laughs> but uh, his name's Abraham, which is a weird thing because he's a Jew and he's got ham in his name. Well, that's kind of a strange thing. <laughs> Maybe wishful thinking. Maybe that's what it is. But that passage there in Genesis chapter number 15, you come toward the end of that passage there and you see Abram and he's been made a promise. And he said, I'm going to make your seed as the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea. Do you see that? And then he says this. Now, let me ask you a question. Now look up from your text just for a second. Let me ask you a question. You ever look for the will of God in your life? You ever want to know, Lord, what do you want me to do? Isn't it strange nobody ever goes and prays and asks the Lord about that? It's just like, hey, Lord, I think I'd like to do that. I'm just going to set about doing it. You better be called to do it. Do you know you're called to do it? If you're not called to do it, you're not empowered to do it. So well, I'll just go ahead and do it. That's why you make a mess of things. Get confirmation from the Lord. Ask the Lord before you jump off into something like that. Don't be a fool and jump off the pinnacle of the temple. The Lord says, hey, the devil says, hey, Lord, jump off the pinnacle that the angel will cast thee, bear thee up. The book of Psalms says so. And he quotes the scripture. He leaves a few things out, perverts it, gives him the New American Standard version of it and the RSV, that kind of thing. The Living Bible, that kind of thing. And the Lord tells him, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, and that kind of thing. You say, what? Well, you have to check that. Well, in that passage right there, you know what you'll find? I think you'll find a lamb, a ram, a he goat. A uh, pigeon and a turtle dove, if I remember that correctly. There's uh, five different animals that are there. Well, I got to thinking about that one time. That means that all those three big animals right there, they have to divide those things into quarters. Well, that means there's four. So three times four is 12, at least unless you're doing fuzzy math. Right? Y'all have fuzzy math over here? Yes, sir. In, in uh, the States, they got, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I just sat down and talked to you. Everybody else is going. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so here's the thing. Over there, what they do is, is they say one plus one is whatever you want it to be. Everything's right. Because <laughs> we don't want to upset you or offend you. There's no absolutes, right? Well, in this passage here, there's three animals there are, that are big animals. If you quarter them, that's four trips. So that's 12, right? Now, if you've ever quartered an animal, like a hog or like a deer, uh, what big animal do you have here? Some they say kangaroos can be seven feet tall here, but I'm talking about like a uh, like a cow. I've seen you've had cows, all right? A what? Okay, a buffalo. We well, take you if you're going to take that buffalo to the altar. It's going to take you more than one trip, isn't it? You probably take the pigeon and the turtle dove in a separate trip. All right, well, if that's the case, you've already made 14 trips. 
the Lord doesn't answer him until he's put everything on the altar that he wants on the altar. When was the last time you went to the altar 14 times about anything? Well, I don't want to become religious. You must not want it very bad. How will I know, he says in that passage right there. I've heard young guys say, preacher, how will I know if God called me to do this, or God called me to the mission field, or God called me that, how many trips you made to the altar? Well, preacher, I went down to talk to the Lord about it. It's hard on your flesh, isn't it? Wears you out, doesn't it? I mean, you get a fellow up and he starts preaching and he starts talking about drinking. You know, back home they call it drinking. You got a problem with drinking? You know, you need to come to the Lord. You got you, Are you drinking? You know, that kind of a thing. It's like, yeah, you got your tents wrong. But at any rate, and you know, the Lord says, hey, come on to the altar. You're like, Lord, I can't go down there now. I think I'm a drunk. And the Lord said, I'm not interested in talking to you about drinking. I'm interested in talking to you about your heart. But Lord, if I go down there now, I know that, no, no, I don't care what they think. Yeah, but Lord, I'm going to wait until maybe he gets on something else because they'll think I'm having a problem. You know, well, there goes Brother Peacock. He must have a problem with drinking and that kind of thing. But here's the point I want to try to make to you as quickly as I possibly can. He's looking for the will of God in his life. And guess what happens? Once he gets everything laid on the altar, there's still the individual, or I mean birds that come out there. There'll be old black-winged buzzards come down there. And they try to snatch off what he's already put on the altar. You ever made a commitment to come to the Lord and to give Him your problems, to give your uh, trouble, your bitterness, your anxiety, your difficulties and put them on the altar and you lay them down there and then after a while they're there and you kind of pick them up and say, now Lord, I appreciate that, but I'm just going to go ahead and take them back because you know they're better off with me than they are with you and you're supposed to cast your cares upon Him for He cares for you, but you wind up picking them back up and carrying them home. You know what I realize? I realize sometimes we don't find uh, well, God's will for our life because we don't spend enough time at the altar and asking Him to do something with it. It's an inconvenient time. Can I say this to you? If you've ever slaughtered an animal like that, it carries a lot of sweat involved in it. Yeah. I mean, pure tea, there's work involved. Not for salvation, but being a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, finding out God's will in your life, it requires some effort. Sometimes the Lord wants to see how serious you are. It doesn't float down like winning the lottery and all of a sudden, you know, you hit the big number and now you're all of a sudden overnight, you're a millionaire. You'll be a pauper before long because you haven't ever handled money. You don't spend any time trying to find out, trying to spend the time that it takes. Fourteen trips he makes and then guess what happens? Oh, the family comes in and says, you're a fanatic. You're a nut. You're crazy. You're whacked out. You're going to church three and four times a week, man. Just turn on the TV. It's Friday night. We're going to have a party. We're going to uh, go to the restaurant. We're going off with the family. I mean, if you were going to a rugby match or something, nobody would think you were crazy. You're coming to a church house with a bunch of people to hear somebody from over in the States. And man, you got to be kidding me. Oh, the family will say you're nuts. Your friends, you know what they'll say? You're nuts. You know what will happen? All of a sudden, the people that are around you, it'll take a hit on your fight. You're giving money to that? Why would you give money to something like that? That's the most ridiculous thing. You're going to build a church building? You're going to have a renovation of a church building? Well, you've lost your mind, man. You're absolutely crazy. They wouldn't think you were crazy if you were adding on to your house. If you were adding on to your house right now and you were going to spend $100,000 to add on to your house, you know what? They'd say, that's a good investment, boy. That's smart. You're really wise. And you give some money to the church. You're like, well, you're an idiot. Why would you do that? I'm working on the one over there on the other side that you can't see. It's eternal. They don't get that. They think you're crazy. Friends and family get in there. And then if you ever dare to get your finances involved, you know what happens? You know what else it does? Those black weed burns come down there. It restricts your freedom. You say, what do you mean my freedom's on the altar? You can't go where you used to go. You can't do what you used to do. You can't hang out with who you used to hang out with. You say, what happened? You put the sacrifice on the altar. Hadn't it cost you friends or family? Hasn't it cost you finances? Hasn't it restrict your freedom in a good way? You can't do what you used to could do. But here's the thing I want you to get out of that passage there. This is the run-up for where we're fixing to go in Genesis 22. This is the run-up to that. He doesn't know that. This is if you're not willing to do these little things, don't expect Isaac to go on the altar. I mean, he's going to get a supernatural kid that comes here before long, and then all of a sudden they'll name him after laughter and that kind of a thing, and the Lord will ask him for that. Don't expect God to ask you to do the big things if you can't bring the animals. If you can't bring the things in your life that God tells you, don't expect him. He's not going to do that. But don't expect him if you won't make 14 trips to have you make one big trip. The only big trip you ever make, the one time you make it, is for salvation. 
after salvation, ladies and gentlemen, you should make a habit. Now, I don't know about you, preacher. I've only been doing this, for, I don't know, somewhere between 35 and 40 years as a pastor, so I'm still a novice at it. But I've learned this. People that make regular use of an altar rarely cause any trouble or create problems. I had an old cuss in my church one time. I say that respectfully, of course, with all the, uh, I guess you could say, all the kindness I can muster. But uh, the old preacher used to say with charity. And I preached a message a bunch of years ago, man. He's dead and gone now. And that old cuss sat back there and the whole time. He gives me that, you know, sort of fold my arms. He's sending me that, you know, message. Like the Baptist salute you get toward the message. People are like, you know, nowadays they're doing this. You know. It's so important, you know. Somebody's getting a hold of me. I can't be pausing for church service. I think you're running numbers or something. But at any rate, you know, gambling on find out where you're. Anyway, but all, he's sitting back there. And he comes up by the end of that message and he walks by me. He didn't even have the courtesy to look me in the face. And he said, I went to the altar when I got saved. If I need to go any more than that, I'll just let you know. And walked out the door. I thought, man, what's the problem? I mean, what's the big deal? If you don't want to go, that's fine. But what you got to send me a message? You worried about these people going? You must be under conviction about that. Why would you get under conviction? Why would it bother you if somebody else goes to the altar? What difference does it make? You know, oh, man, they go to the altar. Well, leave, man. It's okay. You've you know, got a free country. You're still free over here, I guess. You are, right? You can still do what you want to do. Go, leave. It doesn't matter. Why would you keep somebody from going to the altar? I've seen it happen time and time again. I've seen a husband get ready to get up, and I've seen the wife grab him. And now, honey, we got to hurry. You know, we got to get home. I got to roast in the oven, and we uh, we got people coming over, and we need to do that, baby. I need to get up there. I mean, it'd be better for you if I get things right with him. You know, <laughs> that kind of deal. Yeah, but honey, you, you do that later. Just do it here. I mean, we we need to get going. I've seen the wife get ready. The husband pull her down like this. You know, and you. Sit down, you know. I've watched them at youth camp. I've watched the kids get ready to move. That's why we don't let the girls and the guys sit together. And all of a sudden, the girl sends a message. I've seen it happen. It's a strange thing to me that when God asks you to come to the altar, that you know what? It's become a test of wills. It's not just a matter of effort. It's a test of wills. Are you willing to lay on the altar and stay on the altar until God gives you an answer? He doesn't get an answer until he's put all the animals on there, kept the birds off of it to the point of exhaustion. You say, how do you know that? The Bible says he falls into a deep sleep and in the horrors of darkness. That means he is out like a light, like I was yesterday when I got in. <laughs> By the way, many of y'all, if you've been so kind, you say today, oh, you look so much better today. <laughs> It's amazing what sleep can do for a facelift, you know. He's saying, man, you looked 90 yesterday. Now today you look 89, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, you're making progress, you know, a little more sleep and a little more slumber. But well, that's a strange thing. But you know what? He's to the point of exhaustion. When was the last time you prayed to exhaustion? When's the last time you lay? There was a fellow, well, I'm going to tell you his name. There's a fellow, he's still in church, and uh, I get to see him every now and then. His kids are grown up and grown adults now. He's right over on the altar, over on the side over here, preaching at a youth camp. And he's over there, and he's praying and bawling and squalling, and he's struggling with a call and some other things that are going on in his life. And he's over there, and they get through with the invitation, and people are leaving and going and so on and so forth, and he's still right there. And I went over there, and I knelt down there beside him. He's laid out. I mean, laid out. And they're, you know, just, just sitting there. Tears on the floor like this, just all over, just a puddle of tears around him. I said, young man, are you okay? Yes, sir. And I said, well, I'd be glad to pray with you. No, sir. This between me and God. And I said, okay, man, I don't want to get in between that wrestling match. You know, you wind up walking with a limp. And so I'm thinking, I'm, I'm okay, man, you go ahead and have at it. You know, and I said, I'll come back and check on you. I'm fine, sir, he said, like that. I went and the kids were playing. I went and changed clothes and so on and so forth. They went to the snack shack and all. And I snuck back in there. Just one little light that was in the back part of the thing and the exit signs were lit up. And I walk up there, and that bird's still laying right there. And he stayed right there until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and got some stuff. I wrote his name down in my Bible. You say, what? I was impressed with that teenager. He was going to stay there until he got an answer from the Lord. You say, oh, well, he probably just fell asleep. See, it's easy for you to say. <laughs> I don't know what his burden was, but it was real enough to keep him down there at the altar. Can I ask you this question? I'm not trying to be hard on you. You're looking for the will of God in your life. You're looking for an answer to God, an answer to prayer in your life. How many trips have you made to the altar? Suppose just one more trip and you finally get an answer. He's to the point of exhaustion. He's worn out. He's done all he can do. 
and throws up his hands in exasperation and he falls asleep. And lo and behold, guess what? Here comes the Lord walking to the burning flax there and he walks down among the, the, off of the uh, sacrifices that are laid out there and he gets confirmation to what the will of God is and he gets an answer to his question. I bet you if he'd only gone 12 times, the Lord wouldn't have showed up. I bet if he'd have gone seven times, it'd been more than most, but I bet he wouldn't have got an answer. You say, why? God puts stuff like that in the Bible to help you to read past just what's on the pages. These are the things that are written in between the lines there. Man, look how many trips that guy made. You ever come to church and 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 just as dry as cracker juice? And you're thinking to yourself, man, Lord, I just... I mean, I'm, I'm coming, but my goodness, man, I'm just not getting anything. And then all of a sudden you come one day and I mean, it's like the Lord opens up the spigot and the floodgates come open and you get exactly what you're looking for and God fills your cup up. You ever been that way before? Maybe it's a test of your will. Will you keep coming even if you don't get something out of it? Because it's right to do? Well, let's hurry up now. We've got to get over here because I've got to get to Kings. So we'll, we'll get there in just a second. And you get over there. I'm still in Genesis. Yeah. You say, all this in Genesis? Yeah, all, I'm, I'm leaving a bunch of it out. Amen. <laughs> the outline's about 25 pages long. And then I have to stew it down. I have to remember what I have to teach students about stewing down their outlines and stuff. And so I'm over here and I'll get to Genesis 22. And the Lord comes up there to the same fella, Abram. Now he's Abraham. And he looks down, you know what he says? And in Genesis 22, he says, hey, Abraham. And he says, hey, Lord, how you doing? Good to see you. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. This is living Bible. <laughs> King, King James. He says, uh, Lord, he said, yeah, hey, about that boy. Oh, yeah, man, you ought to see that boy. Man, that boy's something else, man. I mean, I was with him when he killed his first deer, man. He can knock the gnat off a fence post at 300 yards. I mean, we're out there when we caught his first fish and so on and so forth. He mounted him and hung him up over the fireplace out there. I mean, the Lord said, you shut up just a minute. Oh, Lord, I just want to tell you, that kid's been a real blessing to me. Boy, I tell you what, I sure am glad you answered me back there in Genesis 15. Boy, what a blessing more. Oh, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Praise Would you shut up for just a minute? I want to ask you a question. Yes, sir, what is it? I want you to take now thy son, thine only son, the land I'll tell thee of, and Moriah, and offer him there for a sacrifice, a burnt offering, if I remember the passage correctly. Yes. Really, Lord? My only son? So, well, he had Ishmael. He considered this boy his only boy. Now here's what winds up happening. That Bible says, and he gets up and he saddles up his donkey there and he rose up, he gets the two men there and he takes his boy and they get ready to head up to that mountaintop. He's less than a day's journey. You see, where's he going? To an altar. But boy, look at the weight of that sacrifice. Do you realize it takes him three days to get there and it should have taken him a day? How fast do you reckon you'd have walked if you knew the most, pre the most wonderful thing in your life, the most pre predominant thing in your life, prevalent thing in your life? How long do you think it'd take you to get up there? Sometimes that Isaac can be named pride. You can spell Isaac P-R-I-D-E. Sometimes you can name that relationship. Sometimes you can name Isaac, you can spell it M-O-N-E-Y. I mean, I can't tell you what it is. And people have different ways of spelling Isaac. I don't know what it is. You say, what is an Isaac? Somebody that you worship more than you worship the Lord? That's a tough one. And the Lord says, uh, where do you want him? I want him on an altar. Oh, goodness, man. Now, Lord, you realize this doesn't make any sense and all that. He doesn't even discuss it. He gets the boy and loads up there and goes. It looks like that boy's in his 30s. And off they go. And man, every step he makes, he's one step closer. And he's sitting there thinking to himself, more there's got to be a way out of this. And a wise say, Daddy, what's wrong with you? You're moving kind of slow. Your arthritis bothering you? No, I'm all right. Boy, just leave me alone. I'll be okay. Just leave me alone. I'm all right. Daddy, you doing okay? You look kind of weak. We need to sit down and rest a spell. Yeah, I'll probably need to sit down and rest a spell, you know. <laughs> yeah, I need, need a little time. The Lord said, let's go, man. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. You ever find yourself moving a little slow to go to the altar and offer what God wants? 
I love passages like that in the Bible. Can you blame a man for loving his son that way? How quick you think God Almighty was to offer his son for you? See, I know me. I'm not worth a man like that dying for me. I'm not worth that. You know what he did? He said, go ahead and die for him too. I'm thinking to myself, man, he's slow doing it. Well, how quick have you been, Peacock, to get up there in Africa what God wants you? God wants your job? Sure, Lord, no problem. When do you want me to go? <laughs> Lord, I love this job. I love doing this job. It provided well for me. I really like it. You ever been slow? You ever been slow to bring that Isaac named B-I-T-T-E-R-N-E-S to the... Lay it up there. That boy's moving slow, man, and then guess what happened? He's moving on an incline. That gravity's working against him. That gravity's pulling against him, man, and every step he's making, he's going, man, he's got to have made a mistake. He's got to have made a mistake. He can't want this. There's no way he can want this. This is crazy. This is nuts. This is insane. Uh, if I'm going to follow a God like that, I mean, man, you talk about the trust of Abraham. My goodness, man. Oh, well, God looks at it, he says, you know, the Bible says he believed in a resurrection. Hey, man, that means he's still got to kill him. You talk about putting your faith to the test. And he gets him up there and he lays him and he says, hey, Dad, he said, let me ask you a question. I realize you kind of got half-timers or, you know, whole-timers or whatever it may be. Something's going on with you. I see the wood. I see the fire. And I see the knife and all. Where's the lamb? Daddy, you taught me well, it's supposed to go on this altar. It's a lamb. I ain't no Cain. I know he wants a lamb. And he looks over his shoulder. He said, uh, God, uh, God will provide, son. Just let's, let's go. And he's looking right out there, and he's hearing the sheep bleat. And he's looking at that boy, and he's thinking, it's you, son. And they get up there and he gets the wood in order and he gets the sacrifice ready to go there and he looks at his boy and he said, Son, the Lord wants you. That's a rough altar, boy. That means he was promised in Genesis 15 that in that boy was going to be, in that seed's going to be the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. And now he's telling him, I'm not going to work it out the way and draw it up the way you drew it up. Like Joseph. Well, Lord, how are you going to get it done? That's the boy. The Lord said, just do what I tell you. He gets up there, boy, and that knife comes down and he's got that pinpoint to that throat. And boy, he's looking up there. And if I could paint, boy, I'd have that old man's eyes and tears, boy, running down his cheeks, boy, like a, oh, I don't know, like a stream running down a mountainside after a rainfall. And them old tracks where time has showed up on there like iron shod hooves have stomped all kind of wrinkles in that boy's face. And it's red and there's snot running down his face and sweat on his brow and tears. He's cried so much there's no more tears coming down there boy he's sitting there dry and the tracks of those tears are just dry there the little sand spots there or salt spots there and he's looking up and he's saying okay Lord okay and he's got that boy by the head and he's rubbing his forehead and he puts that knife to his throat and he gets ready to do it and the Lord says hey yes sir what you doing what you told me well, now I know you fear me. Look over yonder in the bushes. You know what happens? That old ram is over there with his horns on the bushes. You know why it's just his horn? You say, well, that's the curse from Genesis and so on and so forth. No, if he'd have been hung up there, the briars had punctured his skin or anything else, he wouldn't have been without spot or blemish. It's his horns for a reason. You say, why? So the rest of the animal's perfect. I've thought to myself sometime, I bet you Isaac was never more happy to see that ram than ever. Than that. He wakes up and says, Daddy, look at yonder, man. <laughs> His daddy said, man, I'm going to tell you what, I've never been so happy to see a ram either. He goes over there and lays, you talk about a worship service, man. And guess what happens? Sometimes the Lord asks you for the thing that's taken His place. 
You ever lost a loved one? I mean, a soulmate? You ever get mad at God about that? You ever thank God for that loss? The Bible said in everything give thanks. Ever lose a child? Ever lose a little baby? You ever thank God for that? You ever thank God for your divorce? You ever thank God you lost your job? You lost your finances? I'm not talking about just thanking God for a mountaintop. I'm saying, Lord, uh, what needs to be on my altar? What do you want, sir? Uh, you're kind of holding a grudge against me, aren't you? Well, yeah, Lord. I mean, I don't understand why you took that from me. Why don't you thank me for it? I'm, see, I'm talking about a deep relationship. I'm talking about trusting God so much that He can trust you with trouble and that you say, praise the Lord, glory to God. Uh, God knows what He's doing. That's Paul and Silas sitting down there in Acts 16 after they done had their flesh beat off their back. They're sitting there in stocks and they're back in the back. And Paul said, boy, ain't this a blessing, man. Praise the Lord. And Silas is saying, have you lost your mind? And Paul said, no, man, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He said, Paul, they have beat you within an inch of your life, man. We're in stocks and bodies so black and dark back here, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And if you could, it's chained to a wall anyway. And Paul said, you know what? I feel like singing. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God is still upon the throne. And I know the love still, blood still reaches deeper than the stain. At, Silas is thinking, man, you are crazy. Paul said, why don't you join in with me? Just sing the bottom of that you know, passage there. I'll sing the bottom of that song. And Silas is thinking to himself. He said, I don't know. They start praising the Lord in the midst of the trouble and the earthquake comes and the gates open up and they're set free. You say, what are they doing? They're praising the Lord for the beatdown. For the Isaac. For an opportunity to know things about God they wouldn't otherwise know. Well, let me just give you one more. Let's just put an end to this. Put a little bow on the package for you, okay? It's getting late. Y'all are getting hungry and you can smell the food back there and that kind of thing. And I understand that. I'm trying to help you, though. I really am. You say, what are we talking about? We're talking about an altar. I've already given you a half a dozen reasons to go to the altar, and not but one of them, the beginning of the thing, has to do with confessing your sins to reunite your relationship. <laughs> the rest of them have other things. That's a great place to plead your case. That's a great place to find the will of God. That's a great place for you to get some direction in your life. It's a great place for you to just spend some time and have some fellowship and tell them thank you. Well, there's one more problem, though, that happens. I find in the Christian life that before that Bible gets put down, the altar gets put down, and I find out when you're in that passage where we are there in 1 Kings chapter number 19, you know what I find out? I find that they're sitting there at Jezebel's table and they're having a hoot nanny and all that kind of stuff. And the Baal worshipers get up there and have their time. And after it's over, you know, 12 o'clock, they break up. And Elijah looks around and I think he does this. He says, okay, where's the altar now? You know, it's time to get this thing ready to go. And they're looking around and they say, uh, I don't know, fellas, I don't, didn't we... Put, oh, oh he, uh, here it is, preacher. Uh, these weeds and stuff have grown up around it, and, and the stones are not where they used to be. And I, uh, yeah, it's kind of not in good shape. Preacher says, well, Baal's altars seem to be in good shape. What's wrong with God's altars? Do you know now why there was a drought in the land? Because their altars were in need of repair. Do you know why there was a judgment against the nation of Israel and the water dried up? Their altars were in need of repair. Do you know why your life sometimes is just as dry as cracker juice or a stream bed in the springtime when there's been no rain and it's just as dry you could walk across it just like you walked across the Red, uh, the Red Sea there? You know why? Your altars are in need of repair. You know what he said? He said, come ye near unto me. And you know what the Bible says in that next verse right after that? And he said, and he repaired the altar. Before he could offer anything on it, you know what he had to do? He had to rebuild it. You say, why? Because it hadn't been being used. It had been let go. 
weeds and dog fennels and stuff had grown up around it and probably all kind of different kind of animals had taken up the habitation there. Uh, there was nothing stacked there that looked like there had been any resemblance at all of, of a worship service or anything around it. And he gets all that stuff there and then he gets the wood and stuff laid in order uh, and he gets the animal and gets him up there and lays him up and gets everything just like it ought to be. And he backs off. He said, okay, Lord, now I'll show him who's boss. And the Lord said, we got a problem. Uh, he said, no, sir, I rebuilt the altar. I showed him what, told him what happened. I gave them their shot at it. Now it's your turn. The animal's there. It's laid in perfect order and so on and so forth. And the Lord said, yeah, I see all of that. But there's a problem. There's something missing. Okay, Lord, well, what's missing? He said, the thing that they're dependent on more than me. Barrels of water. They're dependent on that more than they're dependent on me. Lord, what would you have me to do? Get you 12 barrels and dump it on the altar. Man, you got animals that are near about screaming. Their throats are so parched and they're dying of thirst and stuff and dying of starvation because there's no crops. And the people are watching the most precious thing that they've been dependent on. they only got a few barrels of it left. And they're watching that thing being poured out there and poured out there. And the Lord said on top of that, go ahead and build a trench and fill the trench up with water. You say, why? The fire doesn't fall until you put on the altar what God wants. I'm almost done. You ever wonder why sometimes when you go to the altar and tears flow? You say, what? My heart's broken. Those tears are up there and the Lord says, you've been dependent on those things more than you're dependent on me. Trust me, give me your tears. Those tears are so special to Him, He puts them in a bottle. You tell me God doesn't see when your tears come down. You don't even know it when an angel comes down and takes that tear and plucks it off your cheek and takes it up there to the battlements of heaven and puts it in a bottle and puts your name up there and sets it on a shelf to be a testimony. This is when you were hurting. And this is when you were sorry. And this is when you were joyful. And the DNA in that tear says everything about what you're going through at the time. Tears are so important. They say so much. They are literally gathered as evidence for you when you get up there. The Lord said, oh, oh, I got a bottle here. It's got your tears in it. There's a little apothecary up here. Yeah, remember when that baby was born? Remember how happy you were? I got a tear. Remember when you lost that loved one? And you get to relive how that was? I got a tear. Oh, it's so special. I save it and put it up. Of all the things to be saved, He saves our tears. I am so glad I have a high priest Amen. that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Broken hearts are a great thing. You say, why? Because it gets His attention. You say, well, why would you, well, why'd you say that? Listen, you realize that when they came, the Bible says they came, they ran the spear into His side. You know what happened? Blood and water flowed together. You know what they say in medical science? I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not a doctor. But when they, that spear punched the pericardium, which is around the heart there, and the blood from the inside or the inner chambers of the heart, all that mixed together and came out. You know what they say? They define that as, they call it a medical condition called broken heart. You say, did the Lord's heart break? I don't know. I think maybe it did for us. And over the sin in the world, and he was so broken hearted, he offered himself. And he was poured out like water. Isn't that what I think it's right, right? Why is he poured out like water? The picture's right there in front of you. He said, I'm going to take the most valuable thing. Do you realize you can go about maybe three minutes if you're really good without air? And you can go about 30 days without food. But you can't go much more than about three days without water or you'll die. You know what the Lord said? Put the water on the altar. And when they pour the water on the altar, man, that old man has lost his mind. And he gets down and he says, okay, and his knees are now in touch with that old muddy dirt down there. And he's got his hands lifted up, upward, and looks up and he says, okay, Lord. And the Lord strikes that altar. But he never struck the altar if it hadn't been repaired. You know what he's saying? Israel, I'm still here. 
Israel, I'm still your God. Israel, if you'll rebuild your altar and put on that altar what I want, I'll restore our relationship. I'll pull you out of the famine. I'll make it rain. But you know what I find? I find the family altars are gone now. I mean, gentlemen, could I ask you a question? Men, some of you were in the meeting this morning. When's the last time your family saw you with the Bible in your lap? Not just in church. When's the last time they heard you pray over them? When's the last time you just walked in, like with Doc here, you just put your hand on their head before they pray and just pray and say, Lord, be with him, watch over him, call his name out. Oh, I remember my daddy used to come in and pray for me and all that. Used to. When's the last time you and your wife joined hand and prayed together? Amen. Altars are broken down, aren't they? Yes, sir. When's the last time you prayed for the direction for your pastor? Direction for the church? Direction for your nation? The leaders of your nation? Altars are broken down, aren't they? When's the last time you watered that altar with your tears and said, Lord, I, I've been carrying this burden far too long. And you take those tears and pour them out there on that altar and then back off and say, okay, Lord, what? You know what you might find? You might find that the fire comes. You might find that God will answer you. But not until you rebuild the altar. Our altars are in need of repair. And your relationship with the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm turning it over to your pastor here in just a second, and I'll be done. Thank you for being so kind and, and listening. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, there's a key component in your fellowship with Jesus Christ. And it's not just being saved. It's after you're saved, knowing Him more than just a forgiving God and a loving God, but knowing Him just as your Savior, but also knowing Him as your friend. And spending some time and let him help you. You say, where does that? That's done during that time at the altar. You say, wait a minute. You're humbling yourself. Your knees are bent. Your head's bowed. And you're coming to the Lord and you're saying, whatever it might be. I don't know what's going on in your life. <coughs> I can tell you this. From the amount of tears I see coming down your cheeks from the men and the women in here, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of agony. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of loss. I can't tell you that I could fix those things. But I know somebody that can. And you know what? You don't need me to get in there to ask for you. That Bible says that we can get in there and if I have that high priest that can be touched with the feelings of my infirmities, you know what I have to do? I don't have to go through a preacher. I can go right in there and say, Father, I sure would like to talk to you. You say, well, how's he going to hear all these people at one time? He's God. Yeah. And he'll give you just what you need. Yeah. But you may have to start by rebuilding the altar. And then guess what? You've got to maintain the altar. What's the best way to maintain the altar, preacher? Use it. Amen. Just use it. You say, it can't be that simple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's that simple. It's so simple, you know what happens? We just ignore it. And before long, it's covered up in weeds. And it's covered up in briars. And it's covered up in thistles. And before long, there's all kind of stuff in and around that altar. It has no business being there. And the Lord says, hey, how about coming to the altar? And you're like, well, Lord, I'd like to, but I've got to get to work. The Lord said, oh, you're going to go to that altar. You're going to sacrifice to that God. Lord, I'd like to, but I've got things to do, places to go, and people to see. Oh, you're going to sacrifice to that God. I understand. No, you know what the Lord does? He comes at an in inopportune time, and he said, how about now? Right. On a Friday night. Well, Lord, uh, okay, Cain. But be careful, and I'm done. Sin lieth at the door. Lord, I'll tell you what I'll bring. Nuh -uh. Lord, what would you have me to bring? Heavenly Father, would you help us tonight to consider these matters and realize...